windows. It looked as if everyone inside had fallen asleep. The killer's name was Danny Boudreaux, and he was thinking about how much he hated Cross and his family. Alex Cross reminded him of his real father, who had also been a cop devoted to his stupid job, and who left him and his mother because of it. Then his mother had killed herself, and he'd wound up with step-parents. Danny Boudreau had been a classmate of Sumner Moore at Theodore Roosevelt. Sumner Moore had always been the perfect suck-up cadet, the perfect student. Well, he taught him a lesson. First, he made it look as if Sumner Moore were the child killer. He'd logged into the Moore's prodigy account and led the cops right to their house. Then he decided to get rid of Sumner. He wanted to teach Cross a lesson now, too. In the next hour, a lot of people would learn not to underestimate Danny Boudreau, not to snub him ever again. He was small for his age, five foot three inches and only 110 pounds. The other cadets called him Mr. Softy because he would melt into tears whenever they teased him, which was just about all the time. Christ, he had enjoyed killing Sumner Moore. It was like killing his whole goddamn school. Danny Boudreau touched the butt of the Smith & Wesson semi-automatic in the deep pocket of his poncho. Hot tears were streaming down his face. He wiped them away with his sleeve. No more, Mr. Softy. He did perfect murders. Nothing in heaven or on earth could save Alex Cross's cute little family now. Danny Boudreau inched his way up the steps to the Cross's sun porch. He reached out to try the door. The young killer broke out in a sweat. He could hardly breathe. He was seeing his worst nightmare. The black giant, Detective John Sampson, was right there waiting for him. But wait, something was wrong with this picture. Danny Boudreau blinked his eyes... Then he stared real hard. Samson was asleep in the big fluffy armchair next to the piano. Danny Boudreau held on to the doorknob for dear life. Then, even slower than he'd come up the stairs, he backed away from the porch door. There would be time for Cross and his stupid family later. He had other business he could take care of. He'd already forgotten that just minutes before he'd been crying his eyes out. He hadn't taken his medicine in seven days. The hated Depakote, his goddamn mood disorder medicine. Danny Boudreau was on the loose in D.C., and he loved it. History was about to be made in New York City. The game had ceased being a game. Jack jogged at a strong, steady pace through Central Park. At 6 a.m., he entered the formal and attractive lobby of the Peninsula Hotel in the West Fifties, just 20 blocks from Madison Square Garden, where the president would be speaking at 11.25. The New York Times was just being delivered into the hotel lobby. He caught the headline, Jack and Jill Killers Feared in New York as President Visits. He was impressed. He let himself into his room and waited. At ten past six, there was a single knock on the door. Jill was on schedule, as always. I look terrible, she said. Sarah's first words. It was so typical of her self-effacing tone, her view of herself. Sarah, the poor gimp. No, you don't, he reassured her. You look beautiful. The Waldorf is hopping already, she reported to him. They think an assassination attempt definitely will be made today. They have an army on hand. Let them think they're ready. Jack said. Now, come here, you. He smiled. May I ravage you? Now? She weakly protested. But she couldn't resist his strong, reassuring embrace. She never had been able to. He pressed up against Sarah. She arched her body hard against him. Their pulses were racing. Slowly and carefully, he slid a silenced Ruger from the rear waistband of his sweatpants. His hands were sweaty. He was holding his breath now. He placed the gun against Sarah's head and fired. A professional execution, without passion. Almost without passion. He shivered involuntarily as he looked down on the lifeless body on the hotel rug. The pain of her life was finally over. I'm sorry, monkey face, he said. 
he put a last note in Jill's right hand. The day of ultimate madness had begun. Jack and Jill had finally begun. The time approached for the president to leave the Waldorf and travel to Madison Square Garden with the motorcade of limousines, police radio cars, and motorcycles. Nearly a thousand plainclothes agents and detectives would be inside the garden for the president's speech. We all had doubts that it would be enough protection. What would Jack and Jill do? I suspected that they planned to do the job up close, and somehow they planned to escape. The motorcade began to move right on time. President and Mrs. Burns were holding hands. It was touching to witness. No regrets. I rode with Don Hammerman. Even he was subdued and distant that morning. I watched everything out of the car window. The people lining the streets were enthusiastic, clapping and cheering. Even New Yorkers wanted a piece of him. He was a good president, a popular one, a courageous one, too. I couldn't help thinking of Dallas, John Kennedy, Robert Kennedy, and Dr. King, the past tragedies of our country, our sorrowful history. The VIP garage underneath Madison Square Garden was a concrete bunker, which was painted bright white. There must have been a hundred Secret Service and New York police gathered there to meet us. I watched Thomas and Sally Burns slowly get out of their armored car. Every second they were out in the open seemed an eternity. Nothing must happen to them, I thought, as if an act of will could stop an assassin's bullet. We began to walk upstairs to the jam-packed garden. The thunderous noise coming from inside the concrete and steel auditorium added to the escalating confusion and chaos. It was decibels beyond deafening. I moved toward the main auditorium stage with the rest of the security entourage. President Burns never let his smile or his step falter as he entered the garden. Cameras flashed, blinding light everywhere, from every imaginable angle. Don Hammerman was at my side, but it was too loud for us to talk in anything approaching normal tones. I searched the crowd. Any one of them could be Jack or Jill. Any one of them certainly could be Kevin Hawkins. Kevin Hawkins hadn't experienced any problems getting into a prime position, a sixth-row seat in the noisy, crowded auditorium. Hawkins was now a tall, brunette woman dressed in a dark blue pantsuit. He also had an authentic FBI ID which identified him as Linda Cole, a special agent from New York. He was impressed by the sheer numbers of the opposition. They were serious about trying to derail Jack and Jill this morning. However, their elaborate preparations struck him as being ironic. Their game plan was an essential part of his. Everything they were doing now, every step, had been anticipated and was necessary for Kamikaze to work. Kamikaze? Who could stop that? Not even God. She's a grand old flag began to play from the loudspeakers, and Hawkins clapped along with the others. Kevin Hawkins was, after all, one of the last true patriots. There was a fire burning inside my chest. I was moving quickly through the crowd, searching for Kevin Hawkins everywhere. My right hand rested on the hard butt of my Glock. I kept thinking that any one of these people could be Jack and Jill. I made it to the second row, just to the right of the ten-foot-high stage. The president was just stepping onto the gray metal stairs. He clasped the hand of a well-wisher. He seemed to have forced the idea of danger out of his mind. Sally Burns climbed the stairs in front of her husband. Secret Service agents seemed to take up all the available space around the stage. I was there when it finally happened. I was so close to President Burns. Jack and Jill struck with a terrible vengeance. A bomb went off. The loudest imaginable clap of thunder struck near the stage. Chaos! The worst imaginable sequence of actions began to unfold, and in very fast motion, pistols and riot control shotguns were pulled out everywhere in the crowd. Thick black smoke billowed toward the ceiling. People were screaming everywhere. I couldn't tell how many were hurt. I couldn't see the president anymore. I finally spotted a cluster of Secret Service agents huddled tightly around the president. Thomas Burns was alive. He was safe. The agents were starting to move him out of harm's way. They acted as a human shield. I had my Glock out, pointed up at the rafters for safety. I shouted, Police! I kept pushing and pulling my way toward the exit that the Secret Service had used to bring the president in. The escape route had been established beforehand. 
Beyond the glowing red exit sign, a long concrete tunnel led to a special visitor's parking area on the river side of the building. Bulletproof, armor-proof cars were waiting there. What else might be waiting? I wondered. A voice shouted for attention as I moved forward as fast as I could. Jack and Jill have always been a step ahead of us. Why did they miss him? They don't make mistakes. I was less than a dozen yards from the president and his Secret Service guards when it hit me. Change the route! I yelled at the top of my voice. Change the escape route! No one heard me shouting. There was too much noise and confusion in the garden. I pushed ahead. Change the escape route! I shouted over and over. We finally entered the whitewashed concrete tunnel. I was right behind the last of the Secret Service agents. Don't go in this way! Stop the president! I continued to yell in vain. The tunnel was full of late-arriving special guests and even more security guards. We were pushing forward against the strong tide coming the other way. I pushed and shoved my way closer and closer to the president and Mrs. Burns. I desperately searched the crowd for the face of Kevin Hawkins. Suddenly, five shots seemed to explode inside the tight phalanx of the people around the president. Three quick, then two more. I couldn't see what had happened up ahead, but suddenly I heard a high-pitched wail, a keening. I shoved my body, all my weight against the crowd, and forced myself toward the epicenter of the madness. Then I could see. I saw everything at once. My mouth felt incredibly dry. My eyes were watering. The bunker-like tunnel had become strangely quiet. President Thomas Burns was down on the gray cement floor. Bright red blood drained from the right side of his face and neck. A professional hit. Jack and Jill. Those bastards! I waded forward, roughly, shoving people out of my way. I saw Don Hammerman, Jay Grayer, and then Sally Burns. Everything seemed to be happening in slow motion. Sally Burns was trying to get to her husband. Secret Service agents were holding her back, trying to protect her. Then I saw a second body. A woman was down near the president. She'd been shot in her right eye socket and throat. She appeared to be dead. A semi-automatic lay near her sprawled body. The assassin? Jill? Who else could it possibly be? I saw Sally Burns reach for her husband. I was afraid that he was already dead. Mrs. Burns was weeping uncontrollably. And she wasn't the only one. Jack calmly watched the maze of bumper-to-bumper -bumper cars stalled near the entrance to New York's Holland Tunnel. He could hear radios blaring on each side of his black jeep. He observed people crying inside their cars. He wanted to tell all of these well-meaning people, What's happened has nothing to do with any of you. He tried not to think about Sarah Rosen. Poor monkey face. But Sarah was the past, and the past didn't matter. As he approached Washington at around seven that night, he made a vow. He wouldn't sentimentalize about Sarah again. He had been Jack. But he was no longer Jack. He was no longer Sam Harrison, either. Then he was home, pulling into the familiar rounded driveway filled with tiny pebbles and a few children's toys. He saw his little girl come running out of the house. He saw his wife close behind her. Tears rolled down her cheeks and down his own. Jesus, God, mercy, the war was finally ended. The enemy, the evil one, was dead. The good guys had won, and the most precious way of life on earth was safe for a little while longer. No one would ever know how and why it had happened, or who was really responsible. Just as it had been with JFK in Dallas, and RFK in Los Angeles, our history was being carefully shielded from the truth. That was the American way. You are my hero, his wife whispered breathlessly against the side of his face. You did such a good, brave thing. He believed it, too. He knew it, deep within his heart. It wasn't over. At a little past noon, the Secret Service received news from the NYPD of another homicide. They had strong reason to believe it was related to the shooting of President Burns. Jay Grayer and I rushed to the Peninsula Hotel. The President? One of the detectives asked as we arrived. 
Any word? He's still hanging in there, 